Greetings, growers from around the world. Jordan River with more Growcast today. Good friend of the show popping by today, Brett from Heart and Soil Project. This guy rocks. If you haven't already seen him, go check out his older episode. He was actually just on Growcast TV for members, our live weekly web show where you can hang out with me live and talk to guests, ask them questions. You've probably seen the clips. You can actually get Brett's full episode of Growcast TV by going to growcastpodcast.com forward slash GCTV. Get a little taste of what it's like in the membership at patreon.com slash growcast. Go check out the free episode of Growcast TV available at growcastpodcast forward slash GCTV. So we'll jump right in with Brett today. Appreciate all of you. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Hello, podcast listeners. You are now listening to Growcast. I'm your host, Jordan River, and I want to thank you for tuning in today. Before we get started, as always, I urge you to spread the show. Share the show with the grower. I appreciate it. Make sure you subscribe so you catch every episode and give us a good rating interview. It really helps us out. Today, we are on the line with someone who's quickly become a friend of the show. He's a very uh, interesting breeder working with Landrace Strains. If you haven't heard his old episodes, go and check them out. We have Brett from Heart and Soil on the line. What's up, man? Hey, Jordan. How's it going? Appreciate you having me on again. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for coming back. We really do love talking to you. Super excited. I mean, we like to talk about breeding and land race and all that, but I'm specifically excited about your new line here, this Afghan line. Why don't you give us a little update on what you've been up to and then uh, weave into this incredible new series of drops you you have here? Yeah. So, you know, um, as you as you kind of probably know, we started off with the Peruvian line, you know, which was kind of unique. Then we had the Mozambique line, which is also, you know, you know, very sativa dominant and not everyone wants to grow sativa. But, you know, this Afghani line um, we've been uh, working on for about a year, you know, selecting a uh, male and uh, we actually selected two females for the uh, Afghani Hindu Kush, just mm. uh, times the Afghani Hindu Kush. And uh, I was really just really excited about working with uh, Afghans again. And, you know, there's there's a couple different varieties you know, in Afghanistan, obviously, and we got some highland varieties, some lowland varieties. Um, what we got was something kind of in between. Whenever, whenever we popped the seeds, we found some, you know, longer um, internode spacing on some, mm. and as opposed to the, you know, the squat, you know, fat leaves um, in, in the traditional Afghani. You know, we got more of like a LA Afi, you know, more of a lanky, uh, mm-hmm. maybe like an Afgu type of uh, profile. Um, out of, out of some of those, but then we also got the nice sh- short uh, stature ones. So we actually got two females that we worked from, and the male was nice and uh, robust and, uh, you know, razor leaves, thick, um, really, really, really potent on the drop of, uh, of pollen. So I was just really excited to work with it. And then we just had some really cool things to work with in, in terms of females uh, to get pollinated in the stable. So it was kind of like a perfect storm. We, um, you know, we wanted to do more of an old school Afghani line and it just so happened that we had a lot of some of these old school strains. So um, I'll kind of just dive right in. We, you know, we obviously did like the Afghani male times, you know, an Afghani, there's two Afghani females. So we got oh. the pure land there. Um, but what we also got was some old school blue dream, huh? um, some old school Jack flash, um, green crack, you know, is, we got, uh, we got those in the mix. So, you know, whenever I first started uh, growing professionally, you know, like 10 years ago, you know, I was working with a lot of those strains. My dream was huge, you know, in Colorado right. when I first started. Um, and I know people talk, you know, oh, F blue dream, you know, but for me personally, you know, it's a, it's a beast. The structure is a beast. Um, you know, it's a, it, it got, it has nice flavor. It's resistant to PM, you know, it was one of the main strains that we grew we had PM issues. Um, Lots of desirable you know, the, traits, the, yeah. Yeah, the you know the yields are nice. Um, you know, so I'm really excited to see what that one does. Um, you know, that I wouldn't sleep on that one. A lot of people are like, oh, Blue Dream. I'm like, that's that's probably one of my top, uh, one of my top four or five picks out of the out of the line. Um, let's see, Apple Pie. Um, I got from uh, Jonathan Covert of Covert Genetics. Dude, that's the um, one I'm looking at. That's the Baklava, have, right? We, yeah, uh, yeah, the baked baklava. Um, that's one of my top picks. Super sweet uh, apple, cinnamon, you know, terps yeah. going on there. Um, uh, what else? The uh, mint gelato uh, or the gelato mint cross. Uh, you know, the, we're calling it the mint uh, mint affogato. 
Mm. That one just had really nice gelato profile. Everything we 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 like in that gelato, the you know the nice deep purple leaf, short squat, fat, um, sweet musky chem you know flavored buds. It's a really nice one. Um, oh, I love the that, pink. Man. The pink. The pink pez. Uh, maybe too many people aren't familiar with it. I have a a good friend and grower of mine. Uh, he, he's the owner of D's Trees in uh, Denver, Colorado, and he actually gave me that that fino, uh, that that pink pez, and it's just how it sounds in terms of flavor. Um, hmm. You know, a, a nice sweet. You know, I mean, it literally smells like like pez and tastes like pez. Um, it's got super purple uh, flowers that goes all the way down to the stem. The calyxes that were the seeds were wrapped in were purple. Some of the seeds actually had like a purple tint to them on their shell and stuff, which is really cool. But yeah, so those are kind of the ones I'm, I'm most excited about, you know, as, as it comes to mind, but um, yeah, we have, I'll just kind of go down the line. We got, you know, at the Afghani, you know, cross, and then we have the Afghani cross to Mandarin Skittles, cross mm-hmm. to Blue Dream, cross to the Pink Pez. we got the Apple Pie, Jack Flash, G- uh, Gelato Mint, the Redhead Stranger, which you find throughout a lot of my lines because I just like the, Structure, right. the existence, the profile. Uh, Trop Santo, you know, that's a that's a nice a nice purple purple hype strain that's that's been really good for us. Uh, Green Crack and Alien Apple. Um, the nice. last three are limited stock and are almost sold out actually. So if you're oh, interested in any of the you know the Green Crack cross, the Trop Santo cross, the Alien Apple cross, I would act you know in the next two weeks because they'll be gone. In two weeks, I, I would um, I would estimate. I'm feeling greedy. I want you to set aside a pack. The three that are jumping out to me is the Alien Apple because I love Alien lines. The yep. um, Baklava is is what I'm. I, I would. I, I'll just. I'll purchase one of those packs right when I get off the phone, man. That's definitely right up my alley. And then the Mint Gelato as well. Those are the three that stand think, out to me. Yeah, those are those are top picks. Top picks. It's a, it's hard, you know, because like I got some uh, more nostalgia, you know, for like the Blue Dream, the Green Crack, and and stuff like that. But some of these new ones, um, you know, the Mandarin Skittles, that one really blows me away mm. in a lot of ways. Um, you know, it's tight buds, but super, super uh, sweet Mandarin um, chirp profile. Oh, man, and, uh, I love that. That, that, sounds, like that. that sounds delicious. Yeah, like an old, old Clementine or something. But, um, but yeah, that's. I mean, I could I could go on all all day about that. <laughs> well, I like the lineup because, like you said, it's kind of like the new old school strains. You know, you can't say like old school strains because then there are real OG old timers who will be like, no, we, we're talking, you know, Panama Red or whatever was back away in the day. But like, you're right. For the younger generations, it's kind of like, or not even younger, just like, you know, me- medium yeah. generation. <laughs> I don't know how to say that. It's like, those are the, a lot of the strains we we're first exposed to as growers. Right. Blue Dream is kind of, there's, there's a really funny episode with Dr. Coco where we were talking about popular strains that everybody likes but don't do it for you personally almost everybody has one i've always been a fan of blue dream but we we rattled off a few of those and uh it's it's just funny how it keeps coming up but i, I would love to do the afghan blue dream cross for some reason those two terp profiles seems like they seem like they would blend really nicely to me but um i think so too but yeah, I, I I digress. There's a lot on that list that I would like to that I would and like that, to grow out. I really I really like to keep around the blue dream. Uh, the whole idea of a lot of these lines um, and the idea of working with land races in general is just to bring back that that a lot of that resistance, um, mm. you know, to PM to to the elements, um, you know. So I feel like the blue dream really holds a lot of those genetic traits in order to um, bring more uh, vigor and more um, straight up. Uh, powdery mildew resistance yeah. to a lot of our lines. Res- so yeah, just just uh, overall strength and vigor, like you said. I want to dig into the Afghani heirloom itself, though. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about um, how it grows. You, you mentioned kind of its traits, its generalized traits, but anything unique about the heirloom itself? Well, um, I found in 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 the in the the taller female. Um, it has a bunch of interesting bright flavors. So like a lot of the Afghans are very low earthy. and savory and musky and earthy. Exactly. Uh, musky. Yeah, exactly. I would say that's, that's probably my, my, my top. Uh, I love uh, that you use this phrase bright. Uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but you said bright flavors. That's such a good description. Yeah. So m- most of them, you know, have like a musty gas terp profile, but there were some that had like a brighter pine, 
mint, you know, lavender, eucalyptus um, kind of came to mind a lot of times. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just that mint, maybe a menthol, you know, like a not as much citrus or anything like that, but um, but more of like a pine menthol mm. like i say eucalyptus some latin in the in the some of the varieties were sinus opening type terpenes. yeah yeah so um and, and like i said that that was in the pack of seeds that you'll get if you get a land race um you know heirloom afghani hindu kish pack from heart and soul seeds from this round you'll probably you'll get two varieties you'll get the shorter variety um and you'll get the you know, that's like more of like, a, you know, eight to nine weaker. And then you got like a 10 to 11 weaker, maybe closer to 10, but um, that has that, that, that uh, eucalyptus bright flavor. So oh, I wanted cool. to, so it's yeah, both. That's cool that you kind of split it both in there. Yes. I, I debated on whether or not I wanted to package those up separately, Right. but you know, I really feel like, you know, in the, I, cause I used about 55 seeds to pop um, to, to find the male and the two females and there were a variety in there, you know, so I wanted to kind of like do it, do its due diligence and not, I mean, I could have selected just the one that I, you know, that I wanted, sure. but like, you know, there's a lot of land race traits out there that, you know, maybe other people, you know, want to dive into. So I, that's, that's kind of why I did that. That's cool, man. I think that was the right move personally. Uh, we got some breeding questions. We got some great uh, questions suggested from our Slack chat for members. Um, nice. Let me just dive into right at the top of the list here. When you're introducing land races into different strains, is there a preference between selecting for a male or female? Have you done better with one or the other? Like, what about introducing land race either from a male or a female? Any preference there? Difference there? Um, I think a lot of just in breeding in general, um, a lot of like dominant traits um, come from the male. You uh-huh. know, in in stu- you know, in ho- breeding horses or breeding dogs, and yeah, the females are important. But I feel like you can really select of what you're selecting um by going with a male but that's why i always try to do a male and two females if possible you know because that kind of opens it up and and you can kind of get a wide selection but i really think i mean as, as important as the females are i would say finding a strong male in a breeding program is more important than finding a strong female makes a lot of sense but that's my personal opinion you know but at the same time i think males you know if you can find that stud male and keep him around you can really, you can really create some, some, uh, some special strains. And then I also, when selecting a male, um, a lot of plants in general, fe- males and females will show pre-sex flower earlier than others. You know, some will almost have like auto flower traits. You put them under 18, six light and they'll start to shoot pistols out uh-huh. and they'll start to show their, you know, their sexy parts, uh-huh. you know? And I like to try to select a male that holds, and holds and holds and and doesn't really show or for that matter release pollen until later on oh. so so if you can get the male to hold a little longer you can get a better pollination um in general like you're if you're going with just one female you know pairing up a male and female is important but you know but what i do a lot of times i i have a lot of different females a lot of different you know um flower times on the females in the same room so if I can get a male to, first of all, I feel like, you know, it, it, um, it, it's a, it points to stability. So like a male that holds its pollen longer, you know, or, or doesn't reveal sex as early to me. Um, and from what I've seen and breeders that I've talked to and worked with that, that is a sign that points to, um, that male is a stable. Wow. Male. Interesting. That is so, super interesting, man. And that's, you know, maybe, you know, it's maybe like an old wives tale kind of thing, but like I, I, uh, a lot of breeding that I do is based on feeling and based on people that I respect and, and what their opinions are sure. what their, and what their experiences are. And that's, and that's kind of what, what's been passed down to me over the years and, and what I've used in my breeding programs and that has been successful for me. So, well, it's all we've had for a long time. I, I am so excited about this new generation of studying cannabis and everything, but I warn people not to kind of confine their mental horizons based on, well, where's the study? Because yeah, we, yeah, we can't, we can't put nature in a box, right? You know, as, yeah. as much as we, as much as we try, right? Also, I'll say those studies haven't been done yet. We're, those two worlds are now starting to clash 
But the reason there are no studies on many of these types of things, because who's going to fund that study? Well, I was just about to say, follow, follow the money. Yeah. The study. If, like if, a lot of studies aren't even published because the results don't. Oh, don't get me started. I do a show. You know, I do. Yeah. Cause I do a show on coffee and, and there's, there's a whole thing about, uh, triggered. about, yeah, I got, dude, I just got triggered. You triggered no, me, me too, big time me too. because the yeah. sugar companies pro- published all these studies pointing the finger at fat in the 1950s and coffee got a bad rap at that time. And you go back and do the science again. And dude, Ed, that's really, really fun. I, now, listen, like I said, I'm for this kind of melding of the worlds, no, we, but we, we got to oh, keep an open mind is my point. Yeah, exa- exactly. It's like, take everything with a grain of salt, follow the money. You know, just because um, use your own brain. Exactly. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it's like, uh, yeah, ex- ex- it's like you and I could go probably dive deep into that one. But yeah, I think, uh, <laughs> totally I, think it's impor- I think it's important to follow, follow your feeling and follow your experience and then also talk to other growers and figure out what they're experiencing in order to get a collective collective consciousness you know it's like let's figure out that's true man yeah and I like I like following your feeling and following your intuition and in gardening because that's part of the process like it's not always all about everybody's gardening path is different of course we always say that on the show but it's not always about like everything being optimal and all of the well, parameters being in, part of it's just the journey of gardening right and you're well, you're we, like if, we, yeah. We all have goals. yeah we all have different goals some of us are trying to make money some of us are trying to right. find ourselves you know some of us are trying to do the two at the same time you know it's like how how can we like meditate in our work and and work huh. on ourselves and you know and that's be true. involved in this awesome plant you know so it's pretty cool to be able to do what i would i do i don't take it for granted for for a day you know to be able to like you know, support my family and, and live the life I do just doing what I, oh, what I, I want that, to do. Like, I'd be doing this anyways. You know, it's like if I was doing this when I was working other jobs, I was like just working other jobs and coming home and not spending any time with my, my family and, 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 uh, diving into the basement. But now that I have kids and, you know, a wife and all that, it's just, you it's just having that, you know, time to, to spend with them is invaluable. So, but you did um, the building years, man. That's huge. And what, what you said was massive. That, that's that's the cost of success and yeah. kind of a similar boat here. You know, like I was podcasting when I was still when I was still growing, you know, I was driving pizzas for for a long time. And and like now, now it's the gratitude is immense. But like you said, everyone's goals are different because when you turn your hobby into your job for some people that ruins it. You clearly oh, you cre- clearly it, have an it, excessive it, amount of drive, it, which is kind of like me. Have, Sorry, say really that again. And say, yeah, you really have to re uh, reconfigure everything and and figure out how it's going to work because you know it's all fun. If it's all fun, it's not always all good. You know what I'm saying? Right. So it's like we got to make a balance between business and pleasure. But yeah, I think I think that's important. I mean, it's like they, uh, I know where where I want to be, so I'm, I don't think I'm a success yet. But it's like the old saying: it's uh, it only took me ten years to become an overnight success. You know, <laughs> it takes take time. Exactly, think man. Well, was, I, I, where you're just like doing well. It's like, no, I ate, you know, we ate ramen. We did, we got, we, you know, we, we, we didn't go in our bedroom because the, that's when the light cycle was, was going, you know what I'm saying? Uh, we had picked our clothes out in the dark to make sure we didn't, you know, harm our plants and stuff like that, you know? Um, and now we, now we're able to grow and, you know, that's the, that's the path, man. That's the evolution. Yeah. And I think that you're on a great one. We, we support you because of a, the style of breeding you're doing is very like, unique and B, you're just super generous with your knowledge and your time and your seeds. So, so I love that, man. I love, I love that personal journey and that's what it's all about. Just like following that path of, of your, of yourself and your career and yourself as a gardener as well. So that's really cool, man. Well, thanks um, for being a journey for real. <laughs> well, pleasure, pleasure to be here, man. I, like you said, with the gratitude, I feel, I can't even express the gratitude I feel for the listeners and, and all that. Let's, I don't, I'm, I'm you're going to draw a tear here. Let's not get sappy. Let's move go, on. Let's go. The, let's the let's IG let's trolls. Yeah, you're, you're going to get me emotional and the IG trolls are going to go off. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't even really have get any out. trolls. We'll be right back with Brett. But before that, shout out to Delta Leaf Labs, one of my favorite partners of ours, deltaleaflabs.com for the most affordable sex testing out there. Use code GROWCAST to get free shipping on your tests. So save on that shipping at deltaleaflabs.com with code GROWCAST. Stop wasting time sexing. Stop second guessing, get them tested, stop wasting space and fertilizer and all that good stuff. All you got to do is go to DeltaLeafLabs.com. Plus, there is a lucky code user uh, who wins free tests. That's right. Delta Leaf Labs is giving away 10 tests to a code user. And Elijah will be on to announce the first winner shortly here. Actually, this next coming episode. So DeltaLeafLabs.com. Thank you so much 
for the best sex testing around. Make sure to use code GROWCAST. All right, let's get back with Rhett. No, listen, let's get back to pollination here. I wanted to ask, since you have pollinated so many plants, I wanted to ask you this question. Uh, People come on my show, they talk about, you know, if you have a male, save the pollen, right? Ooh. Yeah, <laughs> I would like to talk to you about saving pollen, optimally saving pollen, and then follow up question, applying that pollen. At that point, you got to do it by hand. What are your thoughts on open pollination versus hand pollination? I know that was a long question. So it's a it's a complicated question because, first of all, you know, um, a lot of methods come out of necessity. Right. You know, we don't always we would love to just like have clones of our male in our back pocket all the time. Right. We can just like pop it out and throw it in the tent and that have would be it. ideal. But that's not everyone's, you know, not everyone can do that, right? You know, me personally, I'll just go ahead and start without going too far in a, in a circle. I think open pollination is number one. Mm. You know, I think if you can, if you can, you know, find a male, select a male, clone the male, and put, get two, two or three. If you want optimal pollination, we're talking optimal pollination situations here. Get three males, three clones. We put one in, maybe a, ten days mm-hmm. ahead of everything else. Okay. Get it started, and then put the second one in day of everything else, and then put the third one in a couple days after. Oh damn! So it's just like three ticking time <laughs> You're just bombs. Getting rained on. So these ladies are just going to get rained on, no matter if they're indica, sativa, if they drop pistols, if they shoot pistols early. If they shoot pistols late, if you're trying to get just every single pistol pollinated, you know, that is, that is the optimal. That's why I found it. I've usually used two males in the past because three males gets to be, it's like, well, I don't have so much room. Right. But, um, and then you got, you can factor in like that male is going to come out. So you can stick it in the middle or stick it in the corner or wherever, as long as there's proper airflow, those males are going to pollinate those females. And, and, and that's for max yield, right? Like the max reason you yield, do it. Max yield of, of seed. You know, if you're trying right. to crank out seed, that would be, that's what I've done in the past to get just optimal yields. But, um, yeah, so that would be, you know, and obviously, you know, if you get, if you have one male, I like to put that male in a couple days, maybe a day or two earlier, you okay. know, to get it, give it a chance to, to start its flower cycle just a little bit earlier than the females. Just um, so you don't miss any window there. You don't miss any. Yeah. And a lot of times those early uh, pollination, are some of the best seeds, you know, hmm. the later pollinated seeds, you know, sometimes they just don't quite develop as premature as well like that. So, um, if you can get that first round, you know, pollinated, that's, that's optimal. Okay. So obviously open pollination is ideal, right? But like, if you're not, if you don't have that option and you, and all you have is pollen, you know, if you've got it from somebody else or whatever, you know, um, it only, it's only so viable after a certain time Mm -hmm. so you know if you are going to do it um afterwards that pollen is like gold you know because not every not every piece of pollen is going to be viable you know so you're gonna you're gonna dust some plants and that pollen may not take Mm -hmm. it's very possible interesting you know the old the older that pollen is the longer it's gonna uh, i mean the you know the the more degraded it's going to be so you, you know the fresher the pollen you know the more potent so I mean, I'm, so that you're you're doubly hurting yourself because if you have to paint with a little paintbrush, basically, I guess what I'm saying is, would you not recommend that for more than like if you're just doing one or two plants because that's going to take forever. You're not going to get full coverage. Good. You'll get less it's seeds. It's going to take forever. Um, it's very zen, you know. Sure. Uh, there, it, it is zen, you know. And yeah. You can like, and you can pollinate. There's ways to pollinate multiple branches and things like that. But but again, you know, as we talk about if we're doing multiple branches. That pollen is some of it's you know almost microscopic. You're not going to be able to if there's any breeze, you breathe too hard, it could go from one branch to another. Right. And you could you could think you have you know you know blue dream with 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 a Afghani male, but if you have any other pollen, it could it could very Just easily could easily, very easily be cross pollinating you know the wrong strain. Makes sense. So you know I highly recommend only using one pollen at a time. You know, so I know people that have like, oh, I'm going to pollinate this branch, pollinate this branch. I had a company re- reach out to me the other day. They have like a new, um, they have a new technique, you know, a new product that'll help you pollinate just one branch at a, at a time. You, you know, pollinate. You're like, that is not what I'm looking for at this point, man. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's just, come on. You know, it's, it's just, it gets a little bit, um, 
it's not as um, consistent and repeatable. Sure. That way. But for a small time, good option. Like you said, Zen, good option. Maybe not for production if you're going to be saying this. It's not, yes. and, and a lot of people are like, oh, I just want to, you know, have something to play around with, or I really want to keep this strain around or whatever. That's what it's good for. You do, you do what you feel like. Some I I have the strains in my garden because, you know, the those are the strains I want in my garden, you know, and you whatever like I need to do. <laughs> because I'm, so every single that's the whole beauty about breeding is I'm breeding for you know, mostly for me. You know, everyone else is, um, I'm breeding, you know, you know, I get, I get input from other places, but like I breed what I like, you know, so other breeders are going to breed what they like. Yes. And you know, you should, you should have the, you, everyone should have the choice, be able to have the choice to, to, to smoke, medicate, you know, however they do and or grow exactly what they want. And that's the beauty about breeding and about small scale breeding. That's why I always encourage people when people are like, Oh, you know, if I buy your seeds, you know, it's okay if I breed with them. It's like, did you pay for them? They're yours. Right. Yeah. They're yours. I don't own those genetics. So I'm always like, you know, I'm always a open source um, I like advocate. That. That's badass, man. Well, you know, I'm always, I just, I take it as a big compliment that someone wants to agree with my stuff. So that's it. Hell yeah, man. I, I absolutely like that, that policy. And it's interesting what you said, cause it's absolutely right. Like these, I've talked to all these different breeders for breeder features. They all have these different kind of goals like this this person's all about medicating this person wants the hard hitting kind of couch locky indicas you know you're the kind of guy who takes the land race and incorporate like they all have their kind of spin but at the end of the day if you think it tastes good like we do follow you as a breeder we like some of these guys and follow them you know because we like them as a breeder and they're it's, you're a bit of a somali sommelier that's the right word right a, 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 cof, a coffee cupper or some sort of wine judger like that is inherently part of the breeding process. So it's an interesting thought. Yeah. It's like, I, I feel like, uh, yeah, good, good breeders like, um, fine wine, you know, fine beer, and you know, fine food, you yeah. know, they, <laughs> they're a little, they're a little bit harder critics sometimes, you know, yes, um, you're probably right. I would agree with that, but cool. No, uh, there was one thing that, uh, that I wanted to touch on storage of pollinators. You said, you said it doesn't last long. Do you put it in the fridge? What do you think about some people mix it with a little, uh, flower? What do you think about all that jazz? You know, the thing about a refrigerator or a um, freezer, for that matter, there's condensation. Ah, yes. So it's very, you know, it's very dicey when you put anything in a refrigerator or a fridge because it could collect moisture. Moisture. Yeah. You could have a little bit of moisture in there, in the pond itself or whatever, but, but water kills pollen, you know. So like, that's how I like, whenever I'm done pollinating my plants and I don't want to like, just keep pollen, you know, keep, um, I don't want to like over pollinate sometimes. So yeah. I like, I'll spray everything down with water, Sure. you know, and it'll just, you know, it basically just kills everything. You know, it doesn't, uh, so it's, I, me personally, I think, you know, you put it in a, in a cool, dry place, just like you would store seeds and, and use it ASAP. You know, okay, I like that. Um, a lot of people are going to say, you know, oh, put it in the fridge, you know, vacuum sealed, make sure there's no moisture. But it's it's tough, you know, um, pollen because some pollen is more viable than others. You know, it's like whenever you're doing you know open pollination with like a feminized line, for example, that pollen that you that you reverse the you reverse the female to make a male to drop pollen, that pollen is not always super viable. Right. You know, feminized feminized pollen, you know. And that's a whole other category, you know, can be straight up sterile sometimes is my understanding. Sometimes, yeah. Yeah. And it's just, you know, a lot of the males drop, they drop a lot less pollen or, you know, or the, you know, the females that are reversed that, you know, um, they drop a lot less pollen and not only do they drop a lot less, but per pollen granule, you know, it's a very high percentage that, that that's not going to, it's not going to take, you right. know? So, you know, then you have all those factors, then you factor in, you know, oh, I'm going to mail this, put this pollen in a vial you know, um, ship across, you know, after, you know, who knows a lot, there's a lot of collection methods and you could have, you know, roughed up that pollen a little bit too much or, or whatever, sure. you know, so, um, so it's a sensitive think, process is what you're saying. It is, it is a sensitive, it's a sensitive process and it's like a, uh, it's a Time per case basis. Yeah. Per case basis too. It's like each pollen batch is going to be different. Right. So it's a pollen collection distribution is a hope and a prayer. Now, Hey, <laughs> there's a lot of hope and prayers that worked out just fine right <laughs> but you gotta want it i right? like that you know? i like that you're, you're actually solving it. a couple of 
things in my head when you're talking about this, um, you know, this, the selfing pollen being uh, less prolific and and less potent. You know, like when I had my really big room in Humboldt, I never grew from seeds. I always grew from cuts, but I would still find at the bottom of like a pound, you know, from my 16 lighter, I would still find like one seed in one of my buds. And I'd be like, what the, the fuck did this come from? Yeah, so the Jurassic Park, nature finds a way. <laughs> That's a fun, That gets posted in the Slack chat all the time. I love that. Nature finds a way. But that, that, that makes sense to what you said. It probably just had like nanners that didn't burst a lot and were very infertile, really sterile. And that makes a lot of sense as to why you might see one seed amongst a huge crop of clones. It happens all the time. Yeah. Wow. Interesting shit, man. Super interesting. Um, let's see, before we wrap it up here, of course, how have we not done this already? Uh, I'll throw it in the intro heart and soil project on Instagram. That's where you can find Brett and all his lines, heart and soil project on IG, go and give him a follow, go and hit him up. You will see him in there. Maybe we'll get you in the Slack chat for those who aren't on IG. Yeah. I'd like to do like a, some sort of special deal for this, for this podcast. Like, I don't know if you, like, if you hear this podcast, if you like DM me, just tell me you heard this podcast on this date and we'll do like, hell yeah. buy one, get one, buy one, get one free. Oh, Jesus. For the next, what's today? How about for a week after the episode drops a week from the release date? Yeah. Yeah. However you want to do it. Um, you know, we'll just do it through the end of the month or something. No, that would be fine. perfect. Would you mind through the end of February to the end of February? Just mention Jordan river and, uh, and get, <laughs> Get a get you a buy one rule, get one dude. line, you know. So that way I can get a uh, first of all I can get you guys um, a little bit better deal, and then I can figure out, you know, because most people do say, "Oh, I heard a tribute from Growcast or whatever," but some don't, you know. So I'd like to kind of get a more definitive. Oh, yeah. This is how, gonna, how, but this is gonna be. People are gonna rush off to get this. This is great, man. We appreciate that. That's like that's well, anybody, really like, appreciate that. Any, like anybody that comes from you, you know, I kind of I take them as pre-certified, you know decent people you know uh, there's a couple of groups and a couple individuals that have like oh so and so sent me i'm like okay i gotta <laughs> i gotta get you some good vibes you know that's cool man we, that's really what we try to cultivate so i that that means a lot coming from you and i'm sure you're gonna see you're gonna see a spike for sure so heart and soil project on instagram through the end of the month buy one get one free if you mentioned this episode very generous of brett before we wrap it up though man i'm sure you get this a lot after people purchasing seeds do you want to wrap up this episode with some germination tips I'm just not, I'm not even going to set you up. I would just love to hear like what you would tell someone who's saying, Hey, I'm a beginner popping seeds, or maybe even someone who says, Hey, I've had trouble popping seeds in the past. What would you say? What I do, um, you know, there's a lot of methods out there, right. You know, and people like swear, but I'll go ahead and start it. People are going to bash me already, but the paper towel method, <laughs> the paper that's why I didn't set you up. Method, the paper towel method, um, is great for people who have a green thumb. And you can feel the plant, you know, and, and know, you know, okay, you know, it's getting too much. It's a little too humid. It's a little too hot or whatever. Hmm. Um, paper towel method is also one of the biggest failure methods that I've found in people popping seeds. They leave them in there too long or whatever. They mold. And so what I do, I always just take like a, a shot glass or my, my preferred container is like just like a, like a pill bottle kind of, kind of container. And you empty that pill bottle out. You put your seeds in there. You fill the pill bottle up a third with water. You put the top on. You shake it. You take the top off so there's still airflow. Set it somewhere for not not too hot, but you know, like a room temperature room, you know, mm -hmm. or you know above the fridge is what I tell a lot of people because um, it's a little bit warmer up there, like a cabinet above the fridge or right on top of the fridge. Usually within 24 hours, if they're the good seeds, within 24 to 48 hours you'll see that tail pop out. Mm -hmm. And when that tail pops out, I take the seed and I put it in its in its home and I plant it. I always like to say just one seed depth. So like as tall as the seed is, that's usually how how much I bear. Oh, it. so that's shallow. That's maybe shallower than some people might. Yeah, shallow. Wow. I like to do it there. At most, I like to say two seed deep. Whoa. Two seeds. I've been planting my seeds too deep. And I like to pre- moisturize my medium so it's already wet and then i always like to throw something on top of the seed so like i don't some people will like put like they'll get like a tray of rock wool they'll soak the rock wool and then they'll throw the seed in and then they'll like spray it or whatever 
but the seed doesn't have anything on top of it. Uh. Well, it'll germinate just fine. It'll go down. But what happens is it doesn't have any pressure up top to really like build that vigor or build that like structure in the stem. So a lot of times what you'll see is if you do that, the seed will pop up and then flop over. Whoa. Have you ever seen that happen? I absolutely have in the chat. And I never thought that it could be that initial resistance not building its strength. Yeah, like, so I, like if you're going to do rock wool, because like a lot of times you pop in, if you're popping, I usually pop like 50 seeds at a time and I'll do the rock wool method and I'll get the germ, you know, just germinate, get the tail out, put them in and then just take a piece of the rock wool and just put it over the top. No shit. And then I re-wet the medium. So like whether that's like a really, really light pour um, of, or some people would even use a spray bottle. Sure. But the last thing you want to do is like flood the tray and have the seeds like float and like go all over the place. Wow. You know what I'm saying? So that was what happens a lot of people with soil is they like plant their seed and then they water it again. And then that, that seed goes, who knows where it washes. Know? It does, but, you know, it could go to the edge of the pot. It could get buried. If it's too deep, you know, it could try germinate, it could germinate, try to push out, but it's like, it doesn't have the quite the strength to make it to the top. So it'll just die, you know? Um, so that's, that's kind of, that's what I do. Damn, that's man. Would, that's interesting. Just straight water. And you said that you, f- you have a little container, you fill it, fill it up a third full and then you leave it totally uncovered. You can, you can leave it uncovered. I like to put the top back on. Kind of like so half like, covered. Yeah. It's like okay. no light kind of thing. Yeah. That makes sense. That, Cause that's what I was wondering, yeah. but damn dude, that's really interesting. You just soak, you just soak until sprout. Yeah. I just soak until sprout. And then once it's sprouted, put it where it needs to go. I'm, I'm going to try, I'm going to do a little video and I'm going to try multiple methods next to each other. I've always done the paper towel method. So yeah. And it's hard. Cause like, if you don't get it at the right time, you got this like seedling in the paper towel and you got to like figure out how I'm going to plant this like very delicate little sprout, you know? Oh, you mean when it, it kind of grows through the paper towel itself or just like sprouts, like it's like an inch long. Yeah. That, that too. Yeah. You know, ever, you know, I love, I love, I love that uh soak method though. Cause I know some people do it to soften the seed, but why not just let it, sp- that's really interesting. And I, well, I sprout. Do, you do 50 seeds in there, you do a hundred, you do 200 seeds on that one little container. You know? <laughs> yeah. That's crazy, man. Well, there you go, so, everybody. Lo- absolutely love it. And I know the Slack chat is going to, is going to pop off because again, we just had somebody who was having trouble germinating uh, plants flopping over. And I want to say that they were in rock wool. So we were giving them all this advice, but, but upward or rather downward pressure wasn't one of, one of them. The pinch of the other, of the, the side, the side of the rock wool cube, put it on top. And that's what, that's what has helped me in the past. Cause I've had that happen to like a whole tray of, of seeds. And you're like, shit, that was like a lot of money worth of seeds. Like, how could I not have that happen again? Pro tip. Pro tip, man. Absolutely love it. Okay. Um, well, listen, we're here at the top of the hour. This is another great episode, Brett. Thanks for spending this time with us. Anything else here? Any signing off uh, words? Any final words? Signing off words. Oh, follow us. Follow us on Instagram. Heart and Soil Project. We're working, we're working on a website. Yeah, Heart and Soil Project on Instagram. We're working on a website, but it's taken a lot longer than we than we anticipated. So we're going to be driving it home on, on Instagram. Um, you can always always hit me up on uh, B Anderson at heartandsoilproject.com. That's my email, B Anderson at heartandsoilproject.com. When uh, all social media crashes, you can just hit me up there. <laughs> yeah, that's right, man. That'll, that'll probably get you a couple extra people who aren't on IG anymore. So no, it's a good I, call I, mean, I know a lot of people don't feel comfortable putting their information out there and don't want to even do um, chats on Facebook or Instagram yeah. because because big bro- brother's watching. You yeah. Know, and it just, it, it's just starting to suck now too. So I told I, everyone gets it, man. So, yeah. And we're going to, we're going to, um, we're de- eventually going to do a uh, seed email list, um, do specials for just our seed email list, uh, subscribers and things like that. So we're going to move in that direction. Um, ho- hopefully a little bit more autonomy, uh, from the Love Instagram. Hey, yeah, that's, so. that's where it's headed, man. Well, we appreciate it. And we appreciate the awesome buy one, get one offer through the end of February. Go take advantage of that. Everybody. Thank you to all you listeners at Heart and Soil Project on IG, at Growcast on IG. Give us a follow. We'll see you next time, everybody. Be safe out there and grow smarter. Thanks, Jordan. Thank you, Brett. That's our show, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. I appreciate all of you out there. Quick shout out to Coconut before we wrap it up. K-O-K-O-N-A-U-T dot com. Use code Growcast for 10% off your garden monitoring system. Get to know your garden better. More importantly, receive alerts if things get too hot, too dry, whatever. It's important to be able to check on your grow room from anywhere, and Coconut lets you do just that. Support the small 
business, Anton Chan, the owner we love, coconut.com, use code GROWCAST. Uh, thank you to Rizo Rich and his consulting company, Illinois Canna Consulting. Quick shout out to an IG follower, JojoLA024. They're doing some seed auctions with some treatment that they're doing. So go and give them a, give them a follow. Check them out, everybody. And thank you all so much. We'll see you next time on GrowCast. I appreciate each and every one of you. Hope you're doing amazing things in your garden. Talk to you next time, everybody. Bye-bye.